A Not Buddy by Christopher Paul Curtis Chapter 11 The car only went 30 giant steps before it commenced to bucking and finally cut right off. The vampire guy finally caught up with me. He was looking very surprised. He just tapped on the window with his knuckle. He said, Roll the window down for a minute, bud. Sometimes it's terrible to have been brought up proper. Couldn't help myself. I rolled the window down just enough so that our words could get in and out, but his hand or claws couldn't. He said, Okay, what's this? I said, Don't you think I can read? How come you're carrying real human blood around in your car? I showed him my jackknife. I'ma warn you. I know how to kill vampires. This knife is genuine, solid, 24 karat silver. He put both of his hands over his face and shook his head back and forth a couple of times. He said, Sweet baby Jesus, why me? Then he said, Bud, if you were from Flint, I might think you believed that. But you're a Grand Rapids boy. You got to be smarter than that. If I was a vampire, why have I got that sandwich and bottle of red pop? I thought for a second, then the answer jumped out. Bait. He put his hand back over his face. This time, when he pulled them away, he was laughing. He said, Bud, if I was a vampire, I wouldn't have to catch little boys. I'd just stick my things into one of those bottles and have my supper. Besides, where have you ever heard of a vampire that knew how to drive a car? That made sense. In all the moving picture shows I'd seen, and all the books I'd read about vampires, I never could think of seeing one that could drive a car but I wasn't going to take any chances. Could I please see your teeth, sir? What? Your teeth, sir? The man mumbled something, shook his head again, and leaned close to the window glass and opened his mouth. Even though he didn't have fangs, his teeth still looked kind of scary. They looked like they could bite a pretty good grapefruit-sized chunk out of you. Then he said, Bud, I've got to get this blood to Hurley Hospital in Flint. They need it right away for someone's operation. I can look at you and tell you're far too smart to believe in any nonsense like vampires, son. Be a good boy and open the door. I pulled the lock up for him and scooted over to the passenger side of the car. I unlocked my door just in case he had any tricks up his sleeve. He got in the car and said, You'll never know how grateful I am to you, bud. I'll take that horrible image of you putting the car in gear to drive away while I stood by the side of the road in Owasso, Michigan, at 2.30 in the morning, to my grave with me. Thank God you don't know how to drive. No, sir. But if you'd have showed me some things, I'd have learned real quick. Just in case, I watched the way he put the car in gear. So as the next time something like this happened, I'd know how to make a clean getaway. Me and the man headed back toward Flint, driving over the same road it took me so long to walk. Going like this, I was never going to get away from this doggone city. We hadn't been driving for a minute before he started asking a whole slew of questions. Questions that I had to be very careful about giving the right answers to. He said, Don't you feel bad about worrying your mother like this, bud, not buddy? My mother is dead, sir. Most times, if you tell an adult, they'll leave you alone. But not this man. What? I'm sorry to hear that, bud. So you stay with your daddy? Yes, sir. Right in Grand Rapids? Yes, sir. What's his name? Does he work for the railroad? No, sir. The seed started sticking its head out further and further. His name is Herman E. Calloway, and he plays the biggest dog on fiddle you'll ever see. The man shouted, What? I said, really, sir, I swear, for God, it's biggest fiddle in the world. He said, I know your father. Everybody in Grand Rapids does. I didn't say anything. He said, well, I'll be. You know, at first glimpse, I wouldn't say you look that much like Herman. But now that I look at you, I suppose you do. Of course, he's quite a bit bigger, if you know what I mean. This was the best news I'd had all day. My face nearly split in half from my giant smile. Yes, sir. Folks say I'm the spitting image of my old man. He really started shooting the questions at me, so to stop him I said, Sir, could I please have the sandwich and the rest of the red pot before I answer any more questions? 
He slapped his forehead and said, Oh, I'm sorry, bud. I was so surprised about who you are and so happy that you didn't drive off that I forgot all about our deal. He handed me the sandwich and pop and the apple. I was so hungry that I forgot all about scraping the mustard off the bologna sandwich. And even like that, it was the best sandwich I'd ever had in my life. Bud, he said, my name's Mr. Lewis. Now, if you were about 15, 20 years older, you could call me Lefty, but you're not, so you can't. Mr. Lewis will do just fine. I shoved the part of the sandwich that I was chewing into the side of my mouth so I could say, Yes, sir, Mr. Lewis, sir, he said. I'm not ashamed to admit it. You gave me a scare here tonight that I'll never forget. I just know I'll be having nightmares about meeting you for the rest of my life. I'll wake up in a cold sweat many a night with a picture of you in my car pulling away with that blood on the seat. I can see it all now. I'll be sound asleep, deep in the middle of a Ruth Dandridge dream, when all of a sudden I'll be standing on the side of the road in Owasso, Michigan at 2.30 in the morning and I'll be seeing my car and that blood pulling away with nothing of you showing but that little peanut head of yours peeking up over the dash. He looked at me out of the side of his eye. Anyone ever tell you you've got a little peanut head? I gludged down the pop I'd been swishing around in my mouth and said, No, sir. Well, he said, this may be the first time, but unless you undergo some major surgery, I'll bet it won't be the last. Yes, sir. He waited a second, then sounded kind of disappointed when he said, Don't take it so seriously, bud. I'm teasing, you know. I started in on the apple. Yes, sir. Ever been in the army, bud? No, sir. Well, I've got to tell you, I haven't heard so many sirs since I was back at Fort Gordon in Georgia training for the big war. I almost said yes, sir, but I looked at him and guessed he was still teasing. I took another drink of the red pop and saw that when I was raising the bottle, I'd accidentally let some of the sandwich slip out of my mouth down into the pop. There were a couple of chunks of chewed up bread a blob of bologna, and some of the mustard swimming around in the bottle. The mustard was real pretty. It looked like some kind of magical fog. Every time I moved the bottle, the mustardy smoke went into a different kind of shape. Lefty Lewis said, How about sharing that pot, bud? Uh-oh. He took one look and handed it back. He said, Nothing personal, bud. I've raised three kids and have two grandkids. I've learned the hard way about drinking after young folks, but I do believe you need to get in and see a doctor soon, son. It looks to me like you've got a serious backwash problem. That's the most food I've ever seen floating around in a bottle of pop. In fact, that doesn't look like red pop anymore. It looks more like red stew. I real quick chugged the rest of the pop down and ate the apple real slow, because I figured as soon as I was done with it, the questions would start up again. Lefty Lewis said, Aren't you sleepy? This was perfect. I could pretend I was falling asleep and then come up with some answers that would get me to Grand Rapids for sure. I yawned real big. A little bit, sir. All right, here. Give me that core. I think the only thing that's left is a seed or two anyway. I handed him the apple core and he put it and the wax paper from the sandwich in the paper bag. You just stretch out there and have some sleep. In about an hour, you'll be in a nice, comfortable bed. We can have our talk in the morning. He reached in the back seat and said, Here, and handed me a jacket. You can use this for a blanket. The jacket smelled real good, like spice and soap. Lefty Lewis said, Oh, bud not buddy, one more thing before you doze off. Could you reach over into that box and hand me one of those bottles of blood? I haven't had a bite to eat all day. I kept my eyes closed and smiled. I knew I was going to be safe because I'd never heard of a vampire that could drive a car, and I'd never seen one that had such a good sense of humor. Besides, I kept my jackknife open under my leg, and he looked like he'd believed me when I told him it was made out of real silver, even though it probably wasn't. As soon as I had the jacket over me, the smell of the spice and soap and the sound of the crickets and toady frogs outside made my eyes get real heavy. Wow, I must have been real, real tired. Walking and ducking in and out of the bushes between Flint and Owasso was a lot more work than I thought it was. 
Most of the time, since Mama died, if someone even walks close to where I'm sleeping, I'm up in a flash. My eyes fly open and I'm looking right at them. At one of the foster houses where I'd stayed, a woman told me she knew I was going to be a criminal because anyone who sleeps that light has got to have a guilty conscience. Most of the time, the sound of someone else going from sleep breathing to awake breathing in the same room as me is enough to get me up. But this morning I felt like I was at the bottom of a well that someone had filled with tons of thick chocolate pudding. Someone was calling my name from way up at the top of the well. She was saying, Bud, Bud, Bud. Waves from the pudding were slogging me back and forth, back and forth. Bud, wake up, Bud. It was a woman's voice and her hands were trying to shake me awake. Uh-oh, this is number 29 of my rules. Rules and things number 29. When you wake up and don't know for sure where you are at, and there's a bunch of people standing around you, it's best to pretend you're still asleep until you can figure out what's going on and what you should do. I kept my eyes closed, acting like I was out cold, the woman said. Papa, what on earth are all these lumps and bites on this baby's face? A man answered. Well, he was walking all the way from Grand Rapids to Flint. It looks like he provided a pretty paltry meal for every mosquito on the way, the woman said. This poor child must be dead. I hate getting him up. I wish he could stay with us for a while, at least until he's had his sleep. Then I remembered who I was with because Lefty Lewis said, I know, but I've got to get back. He can sleep in the car on the way back to Grand Rapids. The woman rolled back the blanket they'd put over me and said, Papa, Look at his legs. This boy's as skinny as a rail. Shucks. They'd taken off my knickers when they put me in this bed. Now I was going to have to pretend I was asleep even longer, at least until I could figure a way out of being so embarrassed. Lefty Lewis said, Yeah, he's puny. Good thing his legs don't touch when he walks, because if those two twigs got to rubbing against one another, he'd have a fire going in no time. The woman said, That's not funny. He doesn't look like he's been fed right. Now who's his father again? You said you know him. Everyone in Grand Rapids does. I'm surprised you can't remember him. He's quite a big fish there. See, I told you it was smart to pretend you were asleep some of the time. Now I was going to learn more things about my father.